Okay, can you all hear me? Good afternoon, welcome on this lovely sunny day. Uh, really delighted to welcome back uh, Jonathan Bergwerk. Jonathan actually launched our first uh, presentation back in the first week in May. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation on the Marx Brothers. But today he is talking about Benjamin Disraeli. Um, Benjamin Disraeli. Benjamin Disraeli, the 19th century Prime Minister who was the most important British Jew of his time and still a major influence on politics. The focus on Jonathan's discussion will be what makes us Jewish? Is Judaism a religion, a race, or even something else? Jonathan, we're in your hands for the next hour. Over to you. Thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, just so you can all see, this background is uh, not my back garden, unfortunately, but it's of where Disraeli used to live, uh, in Breddenham, in Buckinghamshire, which uh, is well worth a visit. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm just going to do my fiddling about with sharing the screen. So um, hopefully this will all work. Let's see if it does. So um, let's just see if this works. Oops. I'm going to show the thing. That's it. And then display the settings. Right. Okay. So you should have a full screen. Daphne, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see a slide with just that on it? Yes, you can give me a thumbs up. Perfect. So, um, as Stuart mentioned, we're going to be talking about Disraeli, but perhaps I shouldn't really, because although he was born Jewish, he actually converted to Christianity at quite a young age, but despite that, was still seen as the most important Jew of his time. And he remains a major influence on politics today. But the question is, was he good or bad for the Jews? So... Let me start off with a summary of the man. So he is the only Jewish born person to serve as prime minister, British prime minister from any party. In fact, until quite recently, he was the alone in being the only Jewish Tory leader. In fact, the first unconverted Jew to serve in the Tory cabinet was Keith Joseph in 1979. Disraeli was the creator of the modern Conservative Party, of what's now called One Nation Conservatism. He was an influential voice in world affairs, a, a jingoistic imperialist, and a right-wing populist. So it might be ringing some bells with some modern politicians. He believed in upper-class privilege and, and really wanted to be accepted as part of the aristocratic elite of Britain. He was single-minded, he was ambitious, he was extravagant, he had unlimited self-belief. So this reputation is something of a dandy, really. So proud, courageous, and vain. This is really in strong contrast to other Jews at the time who were successful in British society. So for example, Baron Rothschild, was the complete opposite. He was principled and wealthy and prudent and discreet and with impeccable integrity, none of which could be uh, accused of Disraeli having. In fact, Disraeli was disliked by many of his colleagues because of his unconventionality and because he was basically untrustworthy. But he, he was incredibly resilient and he overcame all obstacles to achieve success. Um, despite being baptised, for 50 years he was seen as the most prominent Jew in England, ex expanding the view that it was better to be an English gentleman, even a pretend English gentleman, than a Jew. Yet he was always seen as an outsider. He was never considered fully English by his peers. In reality, he had very little knowledge of Judaism yet he glorified in his Jewish origins. He boasted of the noble achievements of the Jewish people. He was proud of what Judaism had been in the past, yet disdainful of what it had become. 
So he defined Judaism as being a matter of race, not belief. And so he was acknowledged as a Jew. And in fact, he saw Christianity as a lightly modified form of Judaism. By arguing that Jews were a superior race, he unfortunately encouraged modern anti-Semitism. Um, his life reads like the plot of one of his many novels, which I don't recommend, actually. They're kind of a little bit trashy, really. Um, he has now become something of a legend. He, many believe his own propaganda. But the reality is that he was far less admirable than he thought he was. And his achievements were actually modest. He was mostly a showman. Yet, unlike many other prime ministers, he remains well known. Disraeli is arguably famous just for being famous. Okay, so I'm going to split my talk into a couple of different sections. The first bit we're going to look at is his personal life, and then we'll move on to his political life. So, Disraeli was born on Six Kings Road in Bedford Row in Bloomsbury, which this is a modern picture of it on the 21st of December, 1804. And his family had a Sephardi Jewish trading background. He, Disraeli later romanticized his origins and he invented a backstory, a myth really, about his Jewish lineage, tracing his ancestors back to wealthy noble Sephardim of Venetian descent. But in reality, his family were undistinguished. All his grandparents and great-grandparents were born in Italy. His paternal grandfather, Benjamin, moved to England from the ghetto of Cento near Ferrara in 1748. And he became wealthy and he had a shop on New Bond Street where he sold imported Italian products. He also purchased a coffee house which enabled him to buy and sell shares as an unlicensed stockbroker. And in 1801, he was invited to become a member of the committee overseeing the construction of the new Royal Exchange building. This is the one by the Bank of England, still exists today, obviously. He married twice, both times into important London Sephardic families. And he died in 1816, aged 86, having bought a big house in Enfield and leaving 35,000 pounds to his son, Isaac, which made the son financially independent. So um, Isaac, um, over here, he was, Benj he was uh, Benjamin's father. Isaac was a literary critic. He was an intellectual and a historian. And the woman on his right is Maria or Miriam, ne Basevi, that's his mother. So these are, are, are Benjamin's father and mother. Um, the Basavis were also Sephardi. They came from Spain and were related by marriage to many of the established families in Anglo Jewry, such as the Montefiores. We don't know much about Maria. Her son barely mentioned her in all his writings, even in the extended essay that he wrote about his father's life. He may well have resented his lack her lack of appreciation of him. Um, and in adult life, Disraeli is consistently attracted to replacement mother figures who doted on him. That's older women, uh, largely. Um, th these two married, by the way, in 1802, and they had one girl and four boys, and Disraeli was their second child. So Isaac rarely attended synagogue. Um, and became estranged from Judaism in 1813 after a dispute at this synagogue here, Bevis Marks, uh, which still exists and is a fantastic visit if you're looking for somewhere to go to. And the dispute was over a fine of 40 pounds, which was imposed on him by the Sephardi elders because he refused to serve for a year as their Parnas or warden. Um, Isaac thought that many of the synagogue's customs were pretty arbitrary and old-fashioned and obsolete, and he considered it absurd that he was appointed to be one of the congregation's elders. It was actually a, often a way, by the way, the synagogue used to raise funds, because people were appointed, 
didn't want to do it and paid the fine instead of becoming a warden. It's a modern day um, fundraising idea. Anyway, he resigned from the synagogue when the fine was finally demanded four years later in March 1817. He probably resigned then because Isaac's father um, had died the previous year, so Isaac felt free to leave, leave the synagogue. And in order to give his children the opportunities that, that society allowed, um, Disraeli and his siblings, but not interestingly the father Isaac, were baptised as Anglicans on the 31st of July 1817. Thereafter, Benjamin always identified himself as a member of the Church of England. So although Isaac stayed a Jew, he had contempt for traditional Judaism and thought Christianity was its worthier successor. Disraeli Jr. was taught by Isaac that there was nothing of value in his Jewish heritage and that Jews should assimilate. In terms of education, um, Disraeli's younger brothers were later going to be sent to the prestigious Winchester College, but Disraeli himself attended modest schools in Islington and Blackheath, and then after his conversion, a boarding school in Walthamstow. He wasn't particularly happy there, and he left formal schooling age 16, when his education was continued by a private tutor. And it was some, he didn't get a particularly good education. He, he only spoke English and in later life regretted his limited knowledge of Latin and Greek, uh, which is a very strong contrast with um, Gladstone, his main rival in life. He didn't go to university either, which was um, very unusual for British prime ministers. The only other prime minister not to go to university uh, was Wellington. In, the, in November 1821, Disraeli was articled as a clerk to a firm of solicitors in the city of London at a cost to his father of 400 guineas. And in 1823, he changed his name. This isn't going to work uh, over, uh, on the uh, uh, verbally. He changed his name from Disraeli to Disraeli. Well, what does that mean? Originally, his name was spelt D apostrophe Israeli, I of the Israelites. And that was clearly a very Jewish name. By taking out the, post, the apostrophe, he made it far less um, uh, Jewish. He was also creating an image of himself as a dandy, as you can see from this picture. He, he always turned up to work in flamboyant clothes and he created a family crest, which was purely fictitious, which included the, the Latin motto, Forte nibio difficile, which means nothing is difficult to the brave, which was very appropriate. In 1824, he enrolled as a student at Lincoln's Inn uh, to become a barrister, obviously, and joined the chambers of his uncle, Nathaniel Basevi, with the aim of, of, of qualifying <coughs> as a barrister. He only lasted there a few weeks. Uh, before abandoning this profession as being far too much hard work in favour of speculative dealing on the stock exchange, which using money which he borrowed from his friends. Now these were incredibly speculative and they weren't doing very well. So to try to support the stocks, he wrote three promotional booklets extolling the benefits of mining shares in South America didn't work. There was a stock market bubble which burst in 1825 and he and his partners lost £7,000, which is the equivalent of about £400,000 today. Um, he borrowed from money lenders to try to um, meet these claims and they in turn charged high rates of interest and he was continually being pressed by his creditors. This is virtually going to be a lifetime story for him. By the 1830s, he's dodging bailiffs sent around to arrest him. And it's only much later in life when he marries a rich woman did he escape the threat of jail. Um, he only paid off the last of his debts in 1849. Um, so failed as a, as a lawyer, failed as a stock market a speculator, and he's... Um, uh, failed also in, in developing, in, in start setting up a morning newspaper. So after that, he turned to fiction writing. 
And in two mo months, he wrote and anonymously published initially a satirical novel on English political society called Vivian Gray. This was a commercial success. He made 700 pounds from it, as readers thought that the author was from high society, but it also caused considerable offense in that society. He, he satirized and even libeled um, well-known people, including his erstwhile friend. This is the publisher, John Murray, who had actually invested in his newspaper just a few months before. Murray was outraged and the damage to Disraeli's reputation proved long lasting. Um, he was disgraced and called a swindler, a scoundrel and a liar. Not very good for your CV. Um, in, in later years, he tried in vain to, to explain this away as a juvenile indiscretion, um, but, it, but it clearly was more than that. He, he was very reckless and he had a financial failure and all this personal criticism, it triggered a nervous breakdown in him. He really wasn't happy at this point. He was very ambitious. He wanted to be recognized as a real success, but he became acutely depressed as he realized he was making no progress in his career. He, he gradually recovered his health while living at Bradenham, um, which was his father's leased house in Buckinghamshire, uh, um, very close to where his house was, uh, or going to be, excuse me, you can do. Uh, after this, he traveled widely and indulgently in, in Southern Europe and the Near East in the, in, 1830, following in the footsteps of his hero, Lord Byron. He loved the exotic world of the Orient, and he dressed like an Ottoman, smoked Turkish pipes, and indulged his local pleasures. Um, he visited Jerusalem and was really struck by the, the view of it from the Mount of Olives. This actually is a, a picture I managed to find of this very same view. Jerusalem looks rather different today, isn't it? And he spent five months touring uh, Egypt. Re returning to England, he attempted to enter high society and to find himself a rich wife, but he was blackballed by the Athenaeum Club. And by late 1835, his debt stood at £20,000. So to raise funds, he, he wrote two more lightweight novels, Henrietta Temple and Venetia. And these books didn't sell enough, however, to, to raise enough money to service his debts. So he was forced to eat humble pie and to ask his father to bail him out. In 1839, he married the widow of a colleague of his, Mary Ann Lewis. She was 12 years older than him. And the particularly good thing about her was that she had a substantial income of 5,000 pounds a year. And he's quite open, his motives were initially mercenary, but the couple really came to love each other. And Mary in her diary, she later wrote this, Dizzy married me for my money, but if he had the chance again, he would marry me for love. And it was true. Um, so she was attractive and amusing. Um, she was childless. She wasn't that well educated, but she was a fantastic hostess, which is just what he needed. Um, more enticing than anything else, probably, was that she was devoted to him and believed in his genius. So she was a great support. They didn't have any children. And after she died before he did from stomach cancer in 1872, he was really bereft, lonely, um, he missed being appreciated, and obviously he was financially poorer as well. In 1848, uh, he bought the 750 acres Hugenden Manor near High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire. And that's where he was later buried with his wife. And this is their vault. Now you might just be able to pick out, there's actually three panels here. So there's the middle one, which, is, which uh, describes himself and there's, some, there's an outer one as well. Um, so he and his wife are buried there and also the body of a woman called Sarah Bridges Williams, uh, with whom Disraeli had a very long correspondence. Um, there's nothing um, romantically attached here, at least from his side. Um, she was the daughter of a Sephardi Jewish merchant who, like Disraeli, had converted to Christianity 
and she was brought up outside the Jewish community. And when she died in 1863, she left him 30,000 pounds on the condition that she could be buried in this family tomb. So he took that condition and that cleared his debts finally. In later years, his health declined. He was often depressed and he lost his grip on politics, especially towards the end of his life, he suffered considerable anti-Jewish prejudice, attacks and slurs, and he was accused of being a traitor at one point. He published his, fi his final no novel, Endymion, in 1880, November 1880, and received an advance of 10,000 pounds, which was the largest fee paid to that date for a work of fiction. So he's finally gonna die on the 19th of April, 1881, age 76. And reputedly, his last words were, I had rather live, but I am not afraid to die. Okay, so that's his personal life. Now let's move on to his, uh, for which there is nothing special, I have to say. Um, he, um, yeah, yeah, he was not an admirable character. He wouldn't be here other than for his politics. Okay, so what the what's about his politics? Well, he first got involved in politics by writing an anti-Whig pamphlet during the Reform Bill crisis in 1832. So this was the, uh, the, the situation which trying to increase the franchise for the very first time. At that election, he stood unsuccessfully as a radical. And then there was another election in 1832 and he stood as an independent, both times for High Wycombe. The next election, he's gonna stand as a Tory. So his politics were high on rhetoric, but light on practical details, and they were often contradictory. He frequently changed his mind on what he believed and switched support between different policies. He was asked at this point what his principles were, and he replied, I stand on my head. Um, and in fact, the Marquis of Salisbury, who succeeded Israeli as prime minister, described him as without principles and honesty. Disraeli himself, in describing his politics, said the following, I am a conservative to preserve all that is good in our constitution, a radical to remove all that is bad. I seek to preserve property and to respect order, and I equally decry the appeal to the passions of the many or the prejudices of the few. So he's his own man, really. Um, 1835, he lost another by-election, this one in Taunton, and this is when he stood as the official Tory candidate. And in the process, he attacked the Irish MP, Daniel O'Connell. Now, this is a picture of O'Connell. O'Connell um, was misled by inaccurate press reports and thought that Disraeli had slandered him so he launched an outstand, outspoken attack on Disraeli, uh, and this is what he called him, a, a reptile just fit now after being twice discarded by the people to become a conservative. Uh, Daniel O'Connell is a radical Irish MP, I should say. His name shows that he is of Jewish origin. I do not use it as a term of reproach. There are many most respectable Jews but there are, as in every other people, some of the lowest and most disgusting grade of moral turpitude. And of those, I look upon Mr. Disraeli as the worst. So this is very typical of what people uh, felt about him at the time. Now, Disraeli didn't like that, so what did he do? He actually challenged O'Connell to a duel. This despite the fact that Disraeli had never fought at all, and O'Connell just had and what's more, had just killed a person. So what Disraeli was thinking of, who on earth knows? But after O'Connell did this, he, he swore that he would never fight another duel. Um, so he declined the duel. So then what did Disraeli do? He challenged O'Connell's son to a duel, as if O'Connell's son had anything to do with it. So O'Connell's son also unsurprisingly declined to fight on behalf of his father. Um, and, and, the, and the whole thing de uh, de declined. Later in life, Disraeli is going to find it able to curb his emo emotions, and he responded to crude Jew-baiting with an air of mocking detachment. 
So there's another occasion which O'Connell um, has a go at him. Um, and, and Disraeli this time taunts him back. Yes, I am a Jew. And when the ancestors of the right honorable gentleman were brutal savages in an unknown island, mine were priests in the Temple of Solomon, which is a fantastic quote. Um, he's got a very great way with words, Disraeli, and particularly in the House of Commons. This was the, his, the, the place where he really shone, um, like maybe some other modern prime ministers. Um, and uh, we'll see later some of the quotes that he did there. But he's not yet in Parliament. He is um, blackballed. He is considered a bit crude. He's not being successful. So what does he do? He starts working for a Tory grandee, Lord Lindehurst, who's the Lord High Chancellor. And he writes a series of reactionary articles in the Morning Post and the Times. I don't think the Telegraph existed then in which he defended the status quo and the hereditary principle. He also became a JP and he stopped his affair with this woman, Henrietta Sykes. You may remember that I, I said that he wrote a book called Henrietta, uh, which, I, which was not coincidental. She, he was having an affair with her, but he stopped this because this wasn't the done thing. Uh, he joined the Carlton Club and he spent his weekends in grand country houses with those that mattered. And he gradually became an insider by doing their bidding. So at the fifth attempt, he became an MP. This is 1837. Um, this was triggered, obviously, by the death of William IV and the accession of Victoria. There was always a general election when the, when the, uh, the monarch changed. And he got elected as one of the two MPs for Maidstone. The other MP being Wyndham Lewis, who paid his expenses to become MP and whose widow, Wyndham Lewis is about to die, and this is the, the widow is the one who Disraeli is about to marry. In his first speech in Parliament, he, it's a disaster uh, and humiliating for him because he is shouted down by a group of Irish MPs because he attacked the previous speaker, who happened to be this Daniel O'Connell still. And traditionally, maiden speeches were uncontroversial, often consisting of general statements of the politician's belief and background, rather than a partisan comment on a current, current topic. Uh, they usually weren't interrupted or subsequently attacked, so he was unusual in many ways. Uh, when he was shouted down, he responded as follows, I sit down now, but the time will come when you will hear me. And he was dead right. He had this disreputable reputation as a vulgar novelist, and he was viewed with suspicion and prejudice by many of his colleagues. So much to his surprise and annoyance, he failed to get into Peel's 1841 cabinet. He really wanted to get there because he wanted the money that the cabinet position would give him. In fact, he was to be an MP for 15 years before he held office. Um, he felt really slighted by this, by Peel, and he responded with self-righteous indignation. And he became Peel's enemy, um, devoting himself to ensuring Peel's downfall. So he aligned himself with a dissident rump of Tories who were from the traditional Eton educated, high church, landowning aristocracy, which is everything, of course, that Disraeli wasn't, but perhaps wanted to be. Um, and he systematically undermined Paul, an appeal, and openly rebelled against him. Uh, Stuart, you've got your, can you mute yourself, Stuart, do you think? I think that's what's causing the problems. Thank you. Um, so he undermined Peel, and uh, openly rebelled against him in 1845. Uh, and he ultimately, in fact, ruined Peel's career by accusing him of lacking principles. So this is what he said to him, about him, about the prime minister. He is so vain that he wants to figure in history as the settler of all the great questions, but a parliamentary constitution is not favorable to such ambitions. Things must be done by past parties not by persons using parties as tools. So he was attacking his own, his own party 
uh, in exactly the same way that uh, he accused Peel of doing. Um, okay. Um, so through this, he created lifelong enemies, and these were never really reconciled. So the split in the Tory party is about to happen over the Corn Laws, um, and this benefited his career no end, as he was one of the few remaining protectionist Tories who could speak well. This is when Gladstone left uh, the party. Uh, for many years after this, the Tory party is in chaos, and Disraeli is going to spend 75%, three quarters of his 44 years as an MP in opposition. It took him over 20 years to become the leader of the party. Um, and this is in fact a cartoon, a modern car a cartoon at the time in, in, in Punch, I think it is, showing Peel being stabbed in the back by assassins, uh, obviously a take on what happened with Julius uh, Caesar. Disraeli was much better at knocking others down than at being an effective leader. And he was more motivated by his own interests than by public good. Um, and his perseverance to achieve that was legendary. So Gladstone's later going to describe him as a man who is never beaten. Every reverse, every defeat is to him only an admonition to wait and catch his opportunity of retrieving his position. So eventually the Tories got back into power and he served as Chancellor of the Exchequer and leader of the House of Commons. He also wrote weekly gossipy reports of what was happening in, in Parliament to the Queen. And when he spoke with eloquence on the death of Prince Albert in 1861, this brought him much closer to Victoria. She, she really liked him, actually. And in fact, in a diary, she said, of, in a letter, sorry, she said, he is very peculiar, but very clever and sensible and very conciliatory. He basically knew how to treat her. He idealized her, treating her with chivalric reverence and obsequiousness. Um, so he, and in fact, he tells the famous commentator, Matthew Arnold, everyone likes flattery. And when you come to royalty, you should lay it on with a trowel. Now, I've got a couple of clips here from a BBC documentary, um, which was about Disraeli and his relationship with Victoria. The sound quality is not great, unfortunately, so you might need to turn the volume up or it, it, it might not be easy for you to hear, but only for a couple of minutes. Gladstone's decline and death had little effect on the Queen. Years ago, she had unashamedly fallen for his political opponent, Benjamin Disraeli, whose One Nation Toryism was her kind of politics. Besides, he knew how to make her laugh. At Disraeli's private home in the heart of Buckinghamshire, curator Robert Bandy is the proud keeper of the numerous gifts Victoria lavished on Disraeli. This is the dining room. We have an awful lot of portraits in the house for gifts from the Queen. All of them have a crown on the top to tell us exactly who they came from. In case there could be in any doubt. <laughs> in, ca in case there could be in any doubt, exactly. An unconventional visit to Hewenden in 1877 showed Disraeli's political skill and charm. When Disraeli collected the Queen from Wickham Station, he took two carriages with him, one with slightly faster horses, so he could welcome the Queen for the first time on the platform. Obviously, great statesman, showman, lots of bowing and dipping. Very theatrical. Very, very theatrical. People in Wickham loved it. He popped into the first carriage with the quicker horses, got back to Hewenden before the Queen, so he could welcome her in exactly the same way, but for a second time, once she got to the front door of the manor. That's delicious. And um, he obviously was mindful she was a slightly short lady and had the bottom two inches of her dining ah. chair sawn off <laughs> so that her feet were flat on the floor when she sat. If she'd sat on a normal chair, of course, her feet would have been dangling in the air. And he didn't think that was particularly becoming of um, Mark. That's very funny. Okay, so that's the first one. And I've got another one as well, another clip. Disraeli not only amused and flirted with Victoria, he understood her emotional struggles in life. Professor Jane Ridley has written biographies of both Disraeli and Queen Victoria. Disraeli didn't treat her as a stupid woman. Uh, Disraeli treated her as 
a sort of exotic and wonderful queen. He also treated her as an equal. He made her feel by writing her these wonderful um, sort of confidential letters uh, that he was telling her everything and that he was her minister and together they were ruling the country. Um, so he made her feel feel good. She wasn't, you know, before she'd had this awful generation of um, those dreadful old men, she called them, who talked down to her and, and didn't sort of um, uh, flatter her in this way. But Disraeli is on his knees flattering her right from day one. Okay. Um, so Gladstone was one of the people that she didn't like as a, uh, the, the queen. And um, he, Disraeli was delighted to always wind up with Gladstone as much as possible. So one way he did this was he became a champion of the Anglican Church in the 1850s. And he, this included making speeches hostile to the, the biblical, historical or, or higher criticism school and also of Darwinism. Um, so here we have, a, again, a, 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 a contemporary cartoon um, with Disraeli holding back Gladstone from reform. Um, so Disraeli is extolling faith and he's decrying science. Um, he said that he would prefer to be descended from angels than from apes. But he wanted to restore the Tory party to what he saw was its original historical role and its rightful historical role of leadership and guiding national popular reform. So to transform it from a purely aristocratic party to a popular movement embracing the working class. So he placed himself in opposition to the emerging middle classes and the liberals who were dominated by manufacturing interests and, and profit making. Now, I have um, another clip here. Uh, this is from a film which is gonna, which is the, the, the 1931 Oscar winner about Disraeli. And this is the famous actor, George Arliss. Uh, and he's reading out effectively or, or a real Disraeli, uh, real speech by Disraeli. The basis of English society is equality. But here let us distinguish. There are two kinds of equality. There is the equality that levels and destroys and the equality that elevates and creates. It is this last quality that animates the laws of England. The principle of the first equality is that no one should be privileged. The principle of English equality is that everyone should be privileged. Thus the meanest subject of our king is born to great and important privileges. An Englishman, however humble may be his birth, is born to the noblest of all inheritances, the equality of civil rights. He's born to freedom. He's born to justice. He's born to property. Yeah, so you can see he was a great uh, speech writer. He was also a great parliamentary debater. And through his power of his tongue, he effectively managed to pass really controversial legislation even in the, the, the teeth of major rebellions. So uh, Brexit had nothing on the 1867 Reform Act, um, which the Liberals had originally failed to pass, and he got the Tories to pass it, which is um, astonishing. Um, oops, so let me just move on from that. Okay, so the this is another cartoon from the time. Um, You've got uh, Derby, who's the, the official leader, Lord Derby, the official leader of the Tory party and Disraeli, and out flanking and dishing their opponents. So you can see all these um, in the, in the, in the uh, skull, on the, there's all these skulls in the plate on the top, trying to do the dirty on their opponents and get this bill passed, which they succeeded in doing. So getting that bill passed finally gave him credibility in, the, in his party. He was really the only person capable of steering contentious legislation through Parliament. And after Derby or Stanley retired, just um, yeah, 
over here. So this is Stanley. After he retired in 1868, Disraeli finally becomes leader of the Tory Tories and prime minister in a minority government. And as many of you will know, he famously commented, I've climbed to the top of the greasy pole. Um, there was a radical MP at the time, John Bright, who thought that Disraeli becoming prime minister was a triumph of intellect and courage and patience and unscrupulousness employed in the service of a party full of prejudices and selfishness and wanting in brains. So you can see mixed messages coming through there. Um, this, this first government was short lived. Um, it did legislate to end public executions and to stop electoral bribery. But in the next election, 1868, he lost and he returned to opposition. And the next election after that was only in 1874, when Disraeli was nearly 70. And at this time, he got a landslide majority. So this is the, the his real prime achievement in the, in the electoral ballot. And his government stood for what became known as one nation conservatism. And what, how does he define that? As, as follows, the great body of the people of this country are conservative. I use the word in its purest and loftiest sense. I mean that the people of England, and especially the working classes of England, are proud of belonging to a great country and wish to maintain its greatness. That they are proud of belonging to an imperial country and they resolve to maintain, if they can, the empire of England, that they believe on the whole that the greatness and the empire of England are to be attributed to the ancient institutions of this country. And that's the start of this focus on what it meant to be a great British person, uh, um, which has carried through to politics to, the, to this day. His government passed lots of legislation, so social and factory legislation, directed towards a paternalistic um, rather than a welfare state. He significantly improved the standard of living of the working classes. Disraeli himself wasn't involved in the passing of his legislation. It was his home secretary who did, did that. Disraeli himself was more interested in foreign policy. So for example, uh, this uh, the, the famously, without the prior approval of parliament or even his cabinet, he purchased a 44% shareholding in the Suez Canal Company for four million pounds. And famously, again, the money didn't come from the Bank of England, but from the Rothschilds, because they needed it quickly. And appealing to her vanity, he made Queen Victoria Empress of India in 1876. And in return, she created him Earl of Beaconsfield. And I've got another clip from, this time from Victoria's diaries, showing what she felt about this. Showing both political astuteness and glorious creativity, Disraeli announced Victoria was the Empress of India on January the 1st, 1877. She was delighted with the new title. My thoughts much taken up with the great event at Delhi today and in India generally, where I am being proclaimed Empress of India. I have for the first time today signed myself as V, R and I. Yeah, so she was pleased about that. Um, he had a very assertive foreign policy, and this reversed the previous liberal pacifism and really aimed to cement England's imperial glory, as he saw the British Empire as the stronghold of culture and peace and liberty and all things good. Um, oops, in 1878, let me just... Um, Uh, move on quick. Showing. 1878, um, faced with Russian victories against the Ottomans, he used this famous Congress of Berlin to, uh, to get peace in the Balkans. And without a shot being fired, he managed to achieve all Britain's interests. And when he came back, he made this famous speech in, in Parliament with here's a quote from it. We have brought a peace and we trust we have brought a peace with honour. Obviously, these words are later going to be used by Chamberlain after 
meeting Hitler to, to less credit. And I trust that that will now be followed by the prosperity of the country. Um, in supporting the British Empire, however, he also fought un controversial and unpopular wars in Afghanistan and South Africa. And I've got another clip here from this 1929 Oscar winning film, um, which shows the debate between Gladstone and Israeli on the issue. Foreign policy, such as the right honorable gentleman proposes, would not only gain us and deservedly the ill will of other nations, but would ultimately involve us in that great calamity, war. I say that in proposing such a policy, the right honorable gentleman has branded himself as unworthy to be the counselor of England's sovereign, unworthy to be the guardian of England's welfare, unworthy to hold the high office of prime minister. Now that my honourable friend, Mr. Gladstone, with his customary eloquence and tact, has expressed his customary disapproval. <laughs> the issue, gentlemen, is this. Whether you are content to be a comfortable England, meeting in due course for the sad, inevitable fate, or whether you will be a great country, an imperial country, a country where your sons, when they rise, will rise to paramount positions and obtain not merely the esteem of their own countrymen, but the esteem of the world. Perhaps you think that because no war clouds darken the present horizon, that there is no danger. Have you ever seen one of those marine landscapes of the coast of South America? You behold a range of exhausted volcanoes. Not a flame flickers on a single pallid peak. But beneath, there is a dormant danger that will one day awake. Fantastic. So he heavily lost the 1880 election to Gladstone, but remained as leader of the Tories in opposition for another year, eventually resigning in 1881. Okay, so let's have a look at what his attitude was towards Judaism, and, and particularly Jews as MPs. Um, because in 1847, his friend, this is Lionel de Rothschild, was elected MP for the city of London. Um, the, the, the two of them, Disraeli and Rothschild, were close, um, despite Rothschild being a liberal, and so on a political opponent. I think they were close, perhaps because Rothschild lent him loads of money, at least £20,000. And he and Mar Mary Ann were frequent guests at their mansions. Disraeli gave him some inside information about what was going on at Westminster and received foreign intelligence from Rothschild's contacts in return. Now, as a Jew, Rothschild couldn't take the oath of allegiance in the prescribed Christian form. And so therefore he couldn't take his seat. And the argument that the uh, parliamentarians use for that is that Parliament controls the Church of England, and therefore a Jew couldn't be in charge of that if he didn't believe in the Church of England. Uh, Lord John Russell, the Whig leader, proposed that the oath should be amended to permit Jews to enter Parliament. And despite this being anathema to the High Tories, the Israeli spoke in favour of the measure, arguing, however, that Christianity was completed Judaism. And he asked the House of Commons, where is your Christianity if you do not believe in their Judaism? Um, so Jews prof were professing a true religion. It wasn't a pagan thing or anything objectionable. So they were no threats. But he did qualify this by saying, I feel that the race are deficient in many of the qualities as well as in numbers which would make a statesman, for reasons of state, undertake the advocacy of their interests. In other words, he didn't think they were worthwhile bothering with. So he was only literally doing it out of loyalty to Rothschild. 
Um, he, he continued to support efforts to allow Jews to sit in Parliament. Um, and he called on MPs to change what he called the darkest superstitions of the darkest ages. Um, eventually, the Parliament were to grudgingly agree to it, uh, with a minority of Conservatives joining the opposition to pass it. Now, as you can tell from this, his views on Judaism, well, they weren't wholly positive. Um, this was partly because he was always seen as Jewish. He had these exotic good looks. He never denied his Jewish roots. And in a letter to Sarah Bridges Williams, he explained his attitude towards Judaism. So this was the woman who was buried in his tomb. So I, like you, was not bred among my race and was nurtured in great prejudice against them by his father, if no one else. Thought and the mysterious sympathy of organization have led me to adopt the views with respect to them, which I have advocated and which I hope I may say I have affected in their public favor, public opinion. This is the most positive quote, or one of the most positive quotes I could find about him. I think he may have, uh, sorry, about Jews that he wrote. I think he may have written it because he was trying to butter up um, Sarah to give him some money. Um, so he was influenced by this financial legacy he was hoping to get. Um, he was always sensitive about being seen to promote actively Jewish interests. Um, so he refused to grant Moses Montefiore a peerage, for example. Um, I think his loyalties lay far more with his Britishness than any Jewishness. And in the famous 1840 Damascus affair, when Jews were really being pilloried, he kept quiet while lots of other people pointedly spoke. Um, in his book, Lothair, he argued that a moral order in society depended upon there being an accepted religion. So materialism would inevitably fill the void if there was no religion. Um, his views on Judaism were um, ignorant in many ways. He asserted wrongly that Jews who remained Jewish during the time of Jesus were actually just those descendants of those who had left the Palestine at the time. So he thought that most Jews living in Judea became Christians as they had received Jesus's message directly. This is clearly historically nonsense. He also stressed that Jesus and his disciples were Jewish. Um, and he thought that presented correctly, Christianity would be acceptable to Jews as there, in his view, were only a few minor doctrinal points of difference. Um, he allegedly said to Queen Victoria, I am the blank page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So he saw himself as straddling these two different uh, religions. For him, Christianity was completed Judaism, but Judaism was nearly as good as Christianity. Um, and in fact, in another of his novels, Tancred, he argued that Christians should be grateful to the Jews because they enabled the Romans to crucify Jesus and that allowed Jesus to fulfill his mission. Um, now, he regarded the Semitic race um, as racially superior. And the Jews are obviously, in his views, the elite of the Semitic race. Um, so he attributed the survival of Jews partly to the purity of their blood and a natural conservative attitude towards uh, religion, aristocratic privilege and property. So that earlier quote I gave you about how he thought the British were uh, the, the priestly race, it's really very similar to how uh, he saw Jews. So the natural bond between the English people and Jews, and this was not just him holding these views at the time, by the way, there, there were lots of proto-Zionists in England who held this. So the institution and laws of England and much of Europe, in fact, were based on Jewish principles. And so Europe owed a debt to the Jews and should have called them a proper place in society. Um, he, he described in Tancred the embarrassment he felt felt by assimilated Jews like himself towards the religious Jews that remained. 
So he described lower class religious Jews as um, obdurate, malignant, odious, and revolting. Not great. Um, these were the Jews who refused to assimilate. Um, and those that did had considerable political power in his view. They were encouraging revolution in Germany. They were running governments behind the scenes in Spain and France, and they were shaping philosophy and science. I, I think, honestly, he was trying to create a more favorable attitude to Jews and to encourage their assimilation, which we now treat as a negative thing. But in that time, it just meant actually being able to be able to fulfill their potential. But he ended up having a very bad effect, almost the opposite effect on what he wanted. So he encouraged people to have a negative attitude towards the Jews. He effectively wrote the first draft of the Jewish world conspiracy theory. And in 1920, the English version of that notorious fake, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, cited one of his books, Sidonia, as proof of Jewish conspiracy. He based his arguments on racial theory, and that meant that Jews were seen as alien and incapable of becoming normal citizens. So in the end, Disraeli was too much for himself at the cost of the Jewish community. Okay, so let me just uh, stop that. Um, and I don't know whether there's any uh, questions or comments that people have in the couple of minutes we've got remaining. Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much okay. for an, an educational session. Session We've all learned a lot more about Disraeli, I'm sure, that we didn't know before. And what a journey he had for really an uneducated man. I, I would imagine most prime ministers in recent years have had ed university education, so uh, what a remarkable journey he was on. Can I, one quick question for me, his home where he lived in Buckinghamshire, is that open to the public? Yes, it is, absolutely. Right, from the 4th of July. Oh, <laughs> yes, indeed. I assume. Okay. <laughs> Questions from other people? Anybody? Can't see anybody. Rolling across. Was he responsible for building the Suez Canal? Not, not building, um, not building it. No, for buying shares in it. Um, so it was already there, and he just wanted it as a outlet uh, to enable uh, the ships to get to India. Actually, so no, he didn't, didn't actually build it. I remember quite a while ago we had a presentation on the Rothschilds and uh, the investments or the money that they poured into all sorts of projects, and uh, we were told that it was. Uh, the Rothschilds that financed the Suez Canal and many wars and armies over the years. So uh, hence their power grew and their investments grew at the same time. Certainly Suez Canal was one of the best ones they made for them. There was a famous cartoon around that time uh, underneath which was the caption Mozi Inegito and it portrayed one of the pyramids with the Israeli's face on it. Yeah, the Sphinx, that's right. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, right. any, any other questions for Jonathan? Can't see anybody. Do we know how his parents reacted to his um, being baptized and unaccepting the <laughs> Jewish faith? His parents, his parents, his father encouraged it. They were both anti-Jewish really. So his, he was, uh, yeah, he, he was a child at the time and um, they saw Judaism as kind of working class and backward looking and just not what you wanted to be to be a, a, a British uh, citizen um, to, to really make it in society. And that was the most important thing for them. And they had a broigus with their shawls, so what can you expect? <laughs> <laughs> well, Never, nobody has a broigus with their shawls. No, no, of course not. No, no. <laughs> okay, anything else? Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Just a lesson for us all day. If you want to become a wealthy man, you have to marry a wealthy woman. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank good. you very much once again. We look forward to perhaps another session not too far away from here. Um, just to let you know that the July program, which is now being well written by um, 
Daphne. Sorry by Daphne. We, and Marlene will be sending the newsletter out to you, I believe, in the next few days. Is that right, Marlene? Yes. Good. So you'll see another great programme coming to you for July. We have one for August ready for you and working on September now. So uh, we will keep you entertained. But if any of you have got any ideas of things you would like to hear from us, or you know people or, who are good and interesting speakers, you know, please let uh, Marlene know or Daphne know. We're always looking for people who will add something to our agendas and we'd be delighted to hear from you. Or in fact, your own life. If you've got yeah. interesting lives that you can keep us entertained for about an hour, uh, as Jonathan has just done, we would be delighted to hear from you. So have a good rest of the week. Keep well, keep safe, and don't get too sunburnt out there. It's going to be pretty hot the rest of the week. Take care. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Bye, Jonathan. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.